Hello and welcome everybody back to another episode of From the Heart. And the thing that I'm going to be bringing you today is something that I am extremely excited about as I've been sitting on this set of stories for quite a long time and I think it has captivated not only me but basically the entire planet and anybody that loves the horror genre since the 1990s. And the only thing that I could possibly be talking about at this point would be the Silent Hill graphic novel series. Something that I had no idea was even a thing up until about a couple years ago in a book that I've been sitting on for quite some time. And before we get into this, I do want to say that I think it's important to note that this particular set of stories is very different from the Silent Hill franchise that we've come to know and love all these years. With the movies and the game's strange esoteric characters, as well as its utterly terrifying creatures such as the Bubblehead Nurses, all the way to the most iconic one being Pyramid Head, of course, things would be a little bit different in this version. Things would be a little more talkative, a little more populated, actually featuring a lot more characters and a little less silence that we've come to know in the Silent Hill franchise. And something that while I do understand is hard to kind of translate from the utterly terrifying games like Silent Hill 2, where you'll be sitting there and just complete and utter dead silence only until something comes writhing or a board creaks or something smashes through a window, it is something that I did miss a little bit. But overall, I do believe that the Silent Hill graphic novel series has earned a place on this channel and absolutely deserves a good covering. And this is exactly what I'll be trying to do, what I will be trying to flesh out to you all. And the story that we'll be covering today would be the story about a painter. A man who was kind of floating from couch to couch, having these inspiring visions and things that to us would seem only a little too familiar, until eventually he would be forced out of his last home, and actually be forced into the world of Silent Hill, in a way that I've never really quite seen before, with the town itself actually working with this man, and essentially commissioning portraits out of this person, and while there is a lack of pay, they would kind of pay him with his own life. And while you might think that Silent Hill is mostly known for its terrifying elements, for its soundtrack that could be recorded in any factory nearby, this particular story would actually involve a little bit of comedy, with its main character actually, you know, kind of making me think of Jesse from Breaking Bad just a little bit in his mannerisms and his speech patterns and such. It is a story that I did find very entertaining and something that I think you all will as well. But yes, everybody, get your flashlights and your radios tuned, check your closets and floors for any disemboweled bodies missing their arms, kind of gunning for your life, and let us start this strange journey with this man being evicted from his home and starting for his destined position in Silent Hill. It's crap. I mean, it's alright, but I'm just not feeling it. Like something's missing, and I just... Asshole! Is there a problem, Joe? Jesus, Ike! All you ever think about is yourself. I let you crash here because I figured you didn't have anywhere else to go. Maybe you just needed some time to get your shit together. And for months, you've just been sitting there, eating my food, not even trying to get a job. But now I find out you've been doing this with everybody. Ike, you're just a fucking leech. Well, what do you want me to do? And from here, Ike's best friend would cast him out of the apartment. And the only thing that Ike would have to say is, way harsh, yo. And while I think all of us have kind of experienced a friend that would go from couch to couch, these people who don't really seem to contribute anything and just kind of manage to linger around for free, this is what we would see a continuation of as Ike would travel the city in search of any kind of payphone, calling from friend to friend trying to either borrow money or find the next place to stay, offering his services of cooking and laundry, and yet nobody would really come to accept this. And from here, Ike would be utterly and completely homeless. And as he looks at the city around him, would only think to himself, Fuck. But with our next couple of panels, we would see this man traveling down to the subway system, where he would meet a new friend, who would tell him of a new promised valley, and a place that would bring him so much inspiration for these paintings that he's been trying to do. And as he travels down the subway system stairs, this is where things will begin to get a little bit confusing. Walking down to the docking platform, and seeing this very gothic gentleman just kind of sitting there, surrounded by candles. What's Wraith Slayer? Don't know him, huh? They were the shit back in the day. Music today is crap. Don't know where it is. And with the changing of the panels, this was the first time in the story that I didn't really understand exactly what was going on. But apparently some time has passed, and as Ike would sit there trying to contemplate his next move, this other friend will begin to fall asleep, and begin to have nightmares of the town that we have all come to know and love, of Silent Hill, and the vicious and brutal murderings that has occurred there. Screaming out that they're all over him, and to please get away. And as Ike would grab this man by the shoulder, he would merely tell him that he's just having a bad dream. But this man would only go on to explain that no, that this place and these visions that he was just seeing are completely and utterly real. No dreams. I was there. Shadows. Shadows are alive in Silent Hill. 
No one really lives there anymore, and the supermarkets are still stocked with food. It's all just cheese and a big mouse trap. Me and my buddy Phil were the mice, and he let them eat him so I could get out. Whatever you do, don't go there. Only this is exactly what Ike would do. With the next couple of panels, we would see the foreboding imagery written on the walls, things that say abandoned old hope written in blood, and Ike would only think to himself that you had me at food, as a young starving artist who just needs somewhere to finish his masterpiece. To finally kickstart the thing that he's been trying to do his entire life, this man would only come to find peace and solitude in the strange and esoteric town that we personally know has nothing but bad news to offer anybody who manages to cross its misty trails. And as more time would pass and we would see Ike walking through the center point of Silent Hill, he would look up to the skies and would only think to himself that this is what he's been looking for his entire life. And as he continues to hail the skies, he would see a creature that he's never seen before. This is it. Everything I've been looking for. And from here, Ike would go and find a place to live. And with the next set of panels, we would see him beginning his journey of painting all these strange and seemingly demonic characters, and something that would already fit his artistic style would only push his creativity to its most imperfect output. So fucking cool. Now, for those of you keeping track, we are entering week two of Ike TV, an award-winning reality TV show in which our hero finds happiness, artistic fulfillment, and unlimited cable and junk food. Right here in the big old bad town of. And suddenly, the sound of scraping metal will begin. And as Ike would begin to look around, he would see one of the most terrifying things that he's ever seen in his life. As we would see one of these fleshy and torn apart creatures that we've all come to expect out of Silent Hill, but for him, this will be his first time occurrence. And thinking to himself that this might actually be the end of his life, something very strange would happen, as this creature would only continue to move throughout this strange hotel of Silent Hill. And as Ike would watch it walking away from him, back down these dark and rusty corridors, Doors, he will begin to let out a huge sigh of relief, only with the coming pages being something even more terrible. That's right, you bad, bad boys. See all the latest and greatest, naughtiest pay-per-view events here on. And once again, a giant crash would occur. And as Ike would get up out of his bed, away from the self-proclaimed naughtiest pay-per-view, he would begin to look down the halls once again. Only this time, seeing an ensemble of fear, a set of creatures that I have never seen throughout the Silent Hill movies or the games, bring him some kind of body. And as he would seem to walk fearless to these creatures, because at this point, nothing has really happened to him. And at every glance of one of these creatures have basically just left him alone, giving him more and more inspiration for his paintings, this time would be a little more forced and a little more direct. Hey, um, what up? My brush? Cool. And with the next paintings, we would literally see this creature as posing for Ike to form some kind of gory mosaic, some kind of self-portrait of absolute evil, and Ike in turn would only embrace this. Okay, just a little to the left now. Good. Okay, just don't move. But with our next set of panels, we would only see a terrifying set of teeth. And this is where this pure inspiration would come to a turn, where Ike would literally have to watch these creatures hunt down anybody who would enter Silent Hill and essentially force this man to paint these tragedies, to paint the score shriek scenery, and to actually bring to canvas all these terrible murders that we've come to know throughout the Silent Hill franchise. And as Ike would wake up from a strange and vivid dream, communicating to himself that he must have passed out, he would see four strange people running through throughout the hotel of Silent Hill, running for their lives in these strange yellow coats, and Ike would know exactly what comes next. Tourist dudes, no, you, you got it all wrong. They're just different, they're, they're seriously PMSing. And as Ike would watch these people being utterly decimated and ripped apart by these creatures, we would turn the page and see these creatures actually bringing these bodies to him, setting them in front of the canvas, and Ike would only think to himself if he is the next victim, and suddenly realizing that these creatures want him to paint them actually eviscerating these bodies furthermore. Don't make me do this. I, I don't want to. I... I don't want to die. And with Ike being forced to watch these terrible tragedies, to watch these people being torn asunder, we would come to our next panel where something most strange would happen, and something that would really push the main plot point of the story. As a few days would pass, and as Ike is walking across the front doors of this hotel in Silent Hill, something would come through the mail slot, and a set of magazines that he has never seen before, but they would be featuring his very own artwork, of all these different people being torn apart, of all these different creatures that he's come across throughout his time in Silent Hill. 
And even with the terrible events that Ike has been forced to witness, leaving him only something to be more and more excited about. Wait, what What the fuck? So that's where all my paintings have been going for the last six months. I'm famous! Shit! And I am out of here. The first thing I'll do is check in with this agent dude in New York who's been selling all my stuff and say, where's my money, biatch? Live in the best hotels, order room service all the time, gourmet pizza with fresh veggies. Go to the Bahamas, man. Be chillin' with the honeys down there. Head to Germany and be like, imported? Hell no. Just hose me down with a brewery I'll make right here, yo. And wait. And with this rather funny set of dialogue, and something that truly reminds me of Jesse from Breaking Bad, and just kind of contemplating these funny situations that he'll be on once he finally gets out of this town, once he finally achieves the fame that he has always desired for his entire life, something all too familiar would happen. As this man would finally be enveloped by the mist, and realize that he's not going anywhere, and that no brew is going to be hosing him down, and no honeys will be chilled with. As he would suddenly be transported to the center of town. And this would only continue to happen over and over again until Ike would finally give up. The center of town. How the fuck? Fine. Christ. Legs getting tired. No cars wanted to turn over. Wait, ba back here again? Come on! Fuck! I'm almost there. But that mist, it keeps returning me to where I've already been. Fuck it, I'm too far anyway. And once again, we will be returned to the strange reality show going on in Ike's head, where once again, something truly out of place in the Silent Hill franchise will begin to happen. And here we are, one full year into Ike TV. So what's changed for old Ike? Don't let looks fool you. Our hero's been through a lot, and he's taking it one day at a time. Got a routine going, trying new things with the paintings. And being alone's not so bad. He just kind of learned to ignore. And suddenly, Ike would hear the terrifying screech of metal on metal scraping across the door. And knowing that a door is open, running down to the foyer of the Silent Hill Hotel, and seeing a set of people that he knows is only going to end in utter evisceration. So like, are you in charge of here? No. Hey, what's that smell? Who cares? Home sweet home, right? I'm Cheryl, Bengals team captain. And our bus ran over something outside of town and broke an axle. Weird looking thing. But it sandwiched me now whatever it was. And as Ike would begin staring over this giant group of cheerleaders, he would begin to run away in absolute terror, knowing exactly what is going to happen to all these people, and not wanting to paint them whatsoever. And as they would ask him if he's okay, he would only begin to run up the stairs and try to lock himself away, and to actually ignore all these terrors that he knows are right around the corner. There you go, locked in tight. Oh God, so many of them, and nothing that I can do. I didn't see nothing, not a thing. Nuh-uh, nobody here but me. It's nap time. And with the next set of panels, as a strange eclipse would grow over the city, Ike would wake up in a flash and realize that these people are here. Doing some kind of strange cheerleading routine, and something that I thought so out of place for Silent Hill itself. And really managed to kind of put a comedic element on this entire story. As well as adding into the strange confusion that is Silent Hill. There's many points in the story that really just, like I said, confuse me. With the man suddenly falling asleep and having these nightmares, or Ike just managing to find the city of Silent Hill, to the creatures of Silent Hill actually working with this man and actually forcing him to make these paintings, only on top of that, actually sending them out to be sold across the world. And I really wasn't sure if this was just some strange way to kind of draw in more people back to the city, because at some point, there has to be a point in time where everybody in this universe does believe in Silent Hill and, you know, does realize that there is some really bad juju going on here, right? How many times can people come here and have their memories completely torn apart and used against them, to have their bodies actually being torn apart, to all these strange creatures? And throughout the Silent Hill games, I do believe there has been many people who have actually managed to escape this place. But nonetheless, everybody, Ike would be awoken to the strange cheerleader routine. Listen up, you sorry bitches. What the fuck? We have a state championship in front of us. And just because we've had a little bit of a bump in the road doesn't mean that we stop practicing. Asses and elbows, ladies. Move it. Work it. Now. Go Bengals. Go Bengals. Woohoo. You want to go cry to your mamas? Go ahead. They can't hear you. No one can. And suddenly, lightning and rain would crash down upon all these different girls, all these people trying to continue with their routine, and in order to compete at their state championship, and they would be forced to walk back into the foyer of the Silent Hill Hotel. And as we cut to the next panel, Ike would only think that he can hear the terrifying screams of all these women basically being torn asunder by all these different creatures that he's been painting this entire time, and utterly loathing the fact that he will have to watch all of this. Shit, shit, shit. No more screaming. Not painting this. No way. Not. 
what? What the hell? Why didn't they take you? And as all these girls would begin to walk inside, Ike would begin to run towards them. Hey, we picked the lock. Hope you don't mind. You did what now? How? Stupid rain. I was really getting everybody moving out there, but we had to call practice, collegiate rules and all. Y yeah so what's all that screaming about? And as all these girls will begin to look at Ike and actually wonder why this man is just kind of sitting alone in this dilapidated city where it would seem that there is actually nobody here, but yet power and food would still be a plenty, they will begin to ask him the questions that, frankly, need to be asked. So I need to ask you, what what's up with this town? There's electricity, there's cable, and you can get a dial tone, but you can't make a call out. Found all these cars with keys in them, but none of them start. We've got a competition at the end of the weekend. State Trooper usually comes by every couple of days. Probably be here tomorrow. Cool, so we'll stay the night. Wait, you, you don't want to do that, yo. Not here, but why not? And suddenly, one of these college girls will begin to look over at all these different paintings that Ike has made, and actually enunciating that he must have some really strange things going on in his mind. Looking across all these paintings of dead bodies being torn apart by all these terrifying creatures, and Ike would only tell them that they don't know the half of it. And while Ike really has no choice in the situation, knowing exactly what should happen to all these girls, what the pattern will be, they would begin to kind of make themselves at home. As they'd all begin to grow bored and stating that this place is just so gloomy. We would once again Again, see something very strange happen, and something that I don't entirely know how it is possible, as the color pink couldn't possibly be in this much abundance in Silent Hill. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? You know it. Chrissy and Missy project, we gotta get some color in here. I think a nice papore to get rid of the smell. Hey, now hold on. And as everybody would begin cheering about this new home decoration, Ike would run to his room and find that it is far too late to be stopped. My room, no, what are you doing? Oh no, come on. Trust us, we've done this before, and it's for the best. Yo, wait, what do you do with all the beef jerky? Don't you know how many preservatives this stuff has? Beef hormones are bad for you. You wash my clothes too? These aren't my boxers, they actually move. What'd I do to deserve all this? And suddenly, Ike would be visited by not only his roommate that kicked him out, but all these strange beings that would represent the cheerleaders, telling him something that he doesn't really want to hear. And even with, you know, no longer stiff moving boxers, as something I find very disgusting, would be kind of put in his place. As suddenly all these cheerleaders would begin to turn to something else. This isn't your fucking place. You can't just come in here and act like you own it and do whatever the fuck you want with it, Ike. See, Ike? What goes around comes around. You invaded other people's spaces, and now now we're invading yours. And since I'm just some kind of deranged fantasy version of the real Cheryl, I can say that and get away with it. And without getting more and more furious about these women just kind of destroying the inspiration that he's found in this city and developing everything in pink, turning into these strange beings that would seem to have some kind of grasp on his past, Ike would finally lose it. And to not only begin to shout at all these different women, but to completely and utterly say the wrong thing. That's it. That's fucking it. Leave my shit alone and get the hell out of here. If you don't, you're all gonna fucking die. And suddenly all this woman begins staring, and one would approach and slap Mike completely and utterly across the face, looking to almost either break his tooth or to actually chip one of their well-polished nails. No, wait! You got it all wrong, not me, dick! And suddenly, Ike would be forced into what would seem to be some sort of locker, with the door slamming in front of him, and him realizing exactly what he said would only be something that of course is going to, you know, uh, give the impression that maybe he isn't such a great guy to this abundance of cheerleaders. And once again, we would be returned to Ike TV. Welcome back to Ike TV. It's been hours, and I'm an idiot. Until something would begin to knock. Ike right. I saw your name on all the paintings. I thought you might be hungry, so don't try anything. I know seven schools of hand-to-hand -hand combat, and on top of all that, I have a baseball bat. Here's a pen light too. I saw some books and stuff in there. I'm telling you, those things in my paintings are real, and they're gonna kill all of you. That's so weak, man. And as this cheerleader once again closed the door behind him, Ike would only begin to seek solace in these creatures, to actually wonder why they haven't done what they've always done, tearing apart every single creature who's ever entered Silent Hill directly in front of Ike with a paintbrush in hand and forcing him to paint these terrible portraits. Man, I don't know what you guys are playing at. You killed everybody else that's come here, and you usually don't take this long to do it. I'm not complaining, yo. I'd rather you just left them all alone. Let them leave. They're cute. Especially Cheryl. It's just all the suspense. It's... it's killing me. And suddenly, a shriek of terror would pierce through every single wall of this strange hotel. And Ike would only think to himself, yeah, okay, 
that this is finally happening. That the thing that always happens would at least put an end to all the suspense of him waiting to basically paint their dead bodies. And as Laika would begin to kind of leave this strange locker that he's been forced into, he would be greeted by yet another very confusing aspect of the story. As he would suddenly scream out to himself, being scared of what lies in front of him, it would merely only be Cheryl being completely strapped up with all this combat gear that I have absolutely no idea how these people got a hold of. As later on in the story, we would see that every single one of these cheerleaders has been completely outfitted with machine guns, black clothing, as well as headphones to communicate with each other. It really managed to be a part of this where I started to question whether these people were actually real or if they are merely just something to continue to mess with Ike. That maybe Silent Hill was doing what it does best and beginning to kind of mess with him, to mess with his memories, and to mess with every aspect of reality around him. After all, this is what Silent Hill does best, and this is the horror that we've all come to know throughout all the different games and movies. I went shopping. What's up with the artillery? My dad was survivalist, a crazy bastard, but he taught me everything he knew. Yeah, but I mean why? That's something you should see. You remember Missy and Chrissy, right? The redheads. Yeah? They were having a pillow fight. Negligies. Harmless fun. Gotta blow off pressure somehow with all the pressure we're under. But regardless, whatever it was just dragging through that window, then flew off of them, and enough of us saw it. And we have to get Missy and Chrissy back. But what about all the blood? They were caught up a little bit in the struggle, but that's it. Otherwise this room would be completely drenched. They're alive. I can feel it. And we never leave a woman behind. And with this little bit of information, I absolutely knew that things would not be going right for Ike. And basically, rightfully so. As a man who's essentially just kind of stood by with all these people being torn apart around him, and actually kind of waiting to paint them all so he can further his art career, and actually further his own life, obviously. This was a point in the story where I just knew that, you know, things were not going to be ending well for Ike. <laughs> But suddenly, Cheryl will begin to ask Ike the questions that really do need to be answered. And Cheryl will begin to tell him that she's sorry that she didn't believe him about the paintings, but more so needing to know why exactly this man has been left here to live. You've been here a year according to what I could piece together from all those magazine articles. You should know where their layers are, the best time of day to go out, the worst time, and what areas of town to avoid. What are their strengths, their weaknesses? Yeah, there are a couple spots that they always keep me away from. The closest one being the bowling alley. That's where I'll find them. I know it. Suit up, ladies. It's time to kick some monster butt. And just so you know, Ike, you didn't have to do this. It's my job to protect my girls, but you know, well, thanks. Sure. This for my folks in case I don't make it. Try and see that they get it, okay? Too real, man. Let's stock up here, ladies. But what do you want me to do? Stand there and look cute, I guess. And with things just getting more and more confusing, with this strange cheerleading squad that appeared out of nowhere and then was suddenly able to rack up enough combat gear for every single person in this cheerleading squad, these menacing cheerleaders will begin to stockpile anything that they can, walking over to their boss and actually trying to make this thing start over, to rectifying a van and actually finding all these strange gas chambers inside, and essentially trying to load them in the van for something useful later on. But as this would happen, one of them would scream out in the air, incoming, that something is finally approaching and something is finally going to try and take these women down and along with possibly even Ike as we had turned to the next page and actually see all these different entities running towards them. All these strange creatures from Silent Hill that we've already seen Ike kind of working with and this is something that I just don't understand of why exactly they've left this man alive. Like I said I don't know if it's really some sort of situation to kind of draw more people into the city so they would have more people to torment but I don't really know if that was ever the goal of Silent Hill to actually bring in an abundance of people to torture. But nonetheless, we would see these cheerleaders rack up their machine guns and begin to fire out into the open air. As we would see over a dozen of these creatures coming fast and heavy and ready to tear these people completely apart, and this time Ike as well. As he would mention to himself that he so did not sign up for this. And then in the next panel, seeing this giant sordid creature actually running and gunning for this man's head. And with this, Cheryl would fire off a couple shots and actually saving Ike's life. With this strange creature blown to the ground with bullet holes in Sue, and Ike would only ask if this means that they're dating now. And with these strange creatures absolutely vanquished by all these women, I've, something that I've never really seen in Silent Hill is whether or not these people are actually affected by bullets and things like that. I know that we've seen in the games that they can be beaten down with planks, that they can be shot, but those were usually merely just the underlings, the strange creature with no arms, these creatures that would seem to be born and completely live their lives in some sort of weird placenta. I've never really seen such an effective elimination of these creatures. But with victory in hand, the girls will begin to load the gas 
gas tanks into a nearby fire truck and set out for the bowling alley. Take a bath, you smelly losers. And as each one of these cheerleaders would continue to scream out, Go Bengals! Go Bengals! We would see them basically just rampaging every one of these creatures in their path, turning them into said lunch meat like they said before, and probably one of the easiest fights that I've ever seen in any Silent Hill property. But nonetheless, they would eventually make their way to the bowling alley where Missy and Chrissy are. And as everybody enters the facility, calling out Missy and Chrissy, suddenly they would find them plainly in the open of this building. Something that surely I thought was a trap, but at this point I'm not sure if they were just overconfident to see their friends once again. Over here, it's me, Chrissy. Cheryl, help me. Help little Missy. You girls help Chrissy. Mike and me will get Missy. And suddenly, we would see the most amount of pyramid heads in one single space that I have ever seen. And for most people who have played Silent Hill would know that this would pretty much mean absolute and utter death with um, people having their skin completely raked off like we've seen in the movies, or even worse things like we've seen in weird little glitches with the bubblehead nurses. But once again, Cheryl and everybody around her would seem to just not care at all. And they would begin to unleash hellfire upon these creatures. And while it doesn't really seem like much is going on, with them actually being backed into a corner as these vicious beasts continue to make way towards them, towards their inevitable dinner, Ike will begin to have yet another idea. This is crazy. So fucking crazy, yo. Can't possibly work. And as he picks up a can of spray paint, spraying a giant black circle on the wall, this would inevitably and for some reason create a portal into the town of Silent Hill. And as Cheryl's continued to lay down hellfire on every single one of these creatures that is coming after them, Ike would inevitably grab her by the back and pull her completely through this mysterious hole in the wall. And to a place that we've never really quite seen before, something that would almost seem like some sort of art gallery, and a place that would feature almost every single one of Ike's pieces. Only for some of these, Ike did not paint, and it's unclear whether or not this is something that would foretell the future, but nonetheless, Cheryl and Ike are both incredibly confused. What is this place? Fuck if I know. At least we're away from those things. You have to know what this is. You thought it up. No, I mean, kinda. Just felt it, like it already existed. And I just figured out how to get here. That's got my name on it, but I didn't paint it. This is where they took Missy and Chrissy. I can feel it. It's not my fault, Cheryl. All that gruesome stuff. What was being done to those people? You painted all of that from real life, didn't you? Yeah, I just, I didn't want it to be real. They're here, they followed us. And suddenly through the same exact portal that Ike and Cheryl both used, the creatures would begin to emerge once again. And for whatever reason at this point, Cheryl would now have some form of flamethrower. And like I said, I really don't understand where she got all this weaponry. All I can remember from Silent Hill mostly is just having a pistol or a stick and only being able to basically take down one enemy at a time, otherwise being met with certain death. But as each one of these creatures continues to emerge around them, Cheryl would tell Ike that he doesn't need to worry, that she's going to save at least two bullets just for them, just in case, just in case things begin to get a little too dark. And with this, Ike would suddenly get the idea that the paintings are exactly where these creatures are all coming from, and that actually would explain a little bit to why these creatures would even want him to paint these situations, to send them out into the world, to possibly what? expand the grass with Silent Hill the town, something that I don't really know if that is a thing or not. I've never really heard of anything like this. From everything that I've experienced from this franchise, it would seem that everything that pertains to Silent Hill would inevitably stay in Silent Hill. But I could scream out to Cheryl to torch the paintings. And this is exactly what she would do. And with the next couple of panels, we would see Cheryl lighting everything in the room up. And suddenly, the creatures around them would also completely and utterly burst into flames. But with this, this well-lit room would continue to grow darker and darker, into a midnight black where nobody can see anything. Ike, can you see anything? Did we get them all? Oh, jeez. Now what? And suddenly, a window would be open, into probably one of the funniest moments out of this book, as they would actually look out to an entire factory assembly line of all these different creatures actually working on different bodies that have come to Silent Hill, tearing them apart and trying to learn new ways to kind of cast fear into other people. And with this, Ike and Cheryl would look in complete in utter terror. Yo, are they doing what I think they're doing? Oh my god, this is hell. They're working strike jobs. There's just one way to deal with shit like this. Avoid it. And that is exactly what a couch loader would do, all right? They end up walking away, and eventually, walking through the darkness, they would come across another set of doors, one with a window pane to look through, and as they do just so, they would inevitably see Missy and Chrissy strapped to a table with a strange creature talking to a crowd around them. We have a special treat for everyone today. Fresh specimens to dissect. Taking a life. 
is a simple enough matter. But terror flavors the meat with a careful planning. A victim can be kept alive, awash with agony and fear, for what will seem like an eternity to them. Any questions, or shall we proceed directly to the dissections? Fuck this noise. Missy, Chrissy, get ready to run. And suddenly Cheryl would once again pull down the hammer and begin to light this creature up. But as the bullet holes in this creature would come to existence, it would send one of its tendrils across Cheryl's face. Sending her flying to the wall, as Ike would begin to scream out, was something to say to all these creatures. Because after all, they have been working with him for this entire time, and it would seem that maybe he might have a little bit of leverage, should they want these paintings to continue. Wait! It's a sweet deal y'all set up for me. It is, really. But... D do you really gotta eat every sorry motherfucker that comes through here? You believe that you may question us. All I'm saying is, if you want me to keep painting, then all of this stops. We had high hopes for you, Ike. Class, you now have four specimens in which practice to indulge yourselves with. This is beginning to look familiar. Blood, yuck. And suddenly, Ike would reach up towards his tray on the table, a tray filled with the blood of the victims of every one of these creatures, and inevitably throw it against the wall to, yet again, create one of these portals for escape. And with Chrissy still with gun or flamethrower in hand, I'm really not sure at this point, we'll continue to lay down fire on every one of these subduing creatures. With Ike yelling out for everybody to get through the portal, and with Missy and Chrissy jumping through, Cheryl would have one last thing to say to Ike. Hold them off. I'll be back with help. Can't let them out of this place. Okay, shit, how do you use this thing? Melinda, Lisa and Lisa, they didn't make it, Cheryl. I thought we were going back for Ike. No, 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 help me, please, don't leave me here. I'm the captain of this team, Ike, and leaders have to make tough choices. Like my daddy said before they stormed the cave, you do what you have to do to survive. And with this, Cheryl and everybody else would essentially leave Ike to his demise, something that he probably does deserve as a person who has stood still for so long, literally painting the deaths of all these people, literally right there in front of him. I can't really say that this man really deserved to get out of this, that he really deserved a place among the real world, trying to make money off the deaths of everybody who's kind of crossed their paths with Silent Hill, but nonetheless being a bit of a shocking ending for me. As it would seem that at this point, Ike does have some kind of supernatural power, with him kind of making liquids on the wall and them creating different kinds of portals. I'm not really sure if it's just a normal mechanic of Silent Hill itself, but when it comes to the end, Ike had his chance to live, and he was given at least a year to technically live comfortably among these creatures, but thus meeting his end. And with our next panel, we would see the bus full of every one of these cheerleaders screaming off into the distance, yelling, Go Bengals! Go Bengals! In the weirdest scenario that I could ever see cheerleaders even being in, and showing the uniqueness of every one of these stories that lies in this book, every single one of them throughout this Silent Hill omnibus is very different. It gives the reader a lot of diversity of what exactly they would like to see out of these stories. But as the Bengals go off, speeding away from Silent Hill, it would seem like maybe they wouldn't be too far away after all. We made it. We're out of there. And we're still in time for the competition. But are you okay, Cheryl? Are you, are you thinking about Ike? Yeah. Don't worry, C. Yeah. Before you know it, there will be so much going on that you won't even remember his name. And as the cheerleaders continue to speed off, screaming Go Bengals, this would inevitably be the end of our story. And something that I did really enjoy, but like I said, has a pretty different feeling than the original Silent Hill games or even the movies. At least the first one being, you know, more packed filled with characters, being a little less lonely and actually, you know, having more dialogue and being a little less silent with the whole team of cheerleaders actually doing their routine out in the yard of Silent Hill. It just managed to be something very different. And this is something that kind of pertains through the entirety of this book and something that I'm excited to, you know, slowly keep dulling out across this channel is to see what else is offered through these things. As the Silent Hill graphic novel series is something that is getting harder and harder to find, especially if you want one of these omnibuses with every single story involved, I believe there is two of them, and at this point each one on the second hand market is reaching a little bit over $100 to $200, and luckily a while ago I was able to manage to pick one of these up for a mere $80, only to have it destroyed by a co-worker who actually you know, dumped a bunch of water and things like that on it. I was very sad. Luckily, it's still readable, but the resellability is, you know, now gone. But that's not really a big problem for me as I, I never trade and I never give away my books. But overall, everybody, this is a story that I really enjoyed. I really liked Ike's character, and like I keep saying, he really, you know, made me think of Jesse from the Breaking Bad series. With him kind of realizing that his art's being sold off, and literally calling people biatch, telling him, you know, if I go to Germany, I'm just gonna be like, yo, hold me down with what you got. I don't, 
no imported for me. I left a lot of comedy in this series, and it's something that's going to kind of keep happening throughout these stories. And it's not really something that I enjoy too much out of the Silent Hill series. I more want dark. I want darkness rather than comedy. And it's kind of the same way I feel about some of the new Evil Dead stuff. While I enjoy the show, and while I enjoy kind of the further movies, Evil Dead, between one, the remake, as well as Evil Dead Rise, uh, the things that I really enjoy are the darker elements of these things. I like a little bit of comedy thrown in, but I don't want it to be a horror comedy, if that makes any sense at all. But with the whole cheerleading team kind of entering Silent Hill, this is something, you know, that's kind of hard to get away from. But anyways, everybody, I really want to hear what you guys think of this. If you know any of the other Silent Hill stories you'd like to see me get into next, please comment down below. But really, Silent Hill is a franchise that I just appreciate so much. And I couldn't be more excited for not only the TV shows that come out, but as well as the Silent Hill 2 remake for something for me to easily get into. And from what I've seen so far, it seems like they're going to be extremely loyal to the whole thing. But with all these different remakes being made between Resident Evil 4 to all the Resident Evil remakes, as well as the Dead Space remake, I think we're in safe hands. It seems like with these bigger remakes, they're only adding more to the lore, only adding more things for you to find out, rather than to actually change up the entire formula. Kind of leaving the gameplay and everything like that the same, and like I said, just kind of giving us more dialogue, giving us more bits of story, and it's something that I've really been digging the last two years. But yes, everybody, this has been the first story of the Silent Hill Omnibus that I've covered. I'm really excited to kind of get to more of them. A lot of them are a lot more longer, so it'll probably a little bit to you see one of these kind of return to the channel unless there is just clamoring effort screaming for me to you know do another one but i've really been trying to cover a multitude of different things so we're not just doing ice cream man and hellraiser and things like that but uh yes everybody thank you so much for watching i really hope you guys enjoyed that and i'd really appreciate if you talked me down in the comments if you are new here and if you could possibly hit that subscribe button it would be a great help to me it would really help this little channel kind of you know grow and uh, meet some new people and things like that. We also have some more exciting things. We're playing Conker's Bad Fur on the channel. You can go check out the games from the Void series, which is basically just bad horror games from the internet that I find that, you know, once in a while can be good. You know, once in a while. <laughs> but overall, everybody, I'm trying to kind of pump things out on this channel, trying to give it some life and all that kind of thing. And uh, it's been really fun. But anyways, everybody, have yourself a fantastic night, and I will see you on the next episode of From the Heart with more terrifying stories and uh, nightmares to come. <laughs>